Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're gonna get this thing started. My name is Jasper Craig, and I'm gonna be moderating today's panel about Storm Lake and local news and the future of journalism. Uh, big topic. Uh, first, I'm just going to have everyone quickly introduce themselves. Uh, so as I said, my name is Jasper Craven. I grew up in Vermont. I started uh, writing columns at my local newspaper, The Caledonian Record, in middle school. Uh, after I graduated college, I worked at Vermont Digger, which is a nonprofit news outlet here in the state. Uh, I'm now a freelance investigative reporter in New York. I mostly cover uh, the military and veterans issues. Hi, I'm Shay Evans. Um, I'm the editor and founder of the Charlotte Bridge in Charlotte. I've been, I went to undergrad and graduate school for fiction writing, and now I don't make stuff up anymore. And I am, um, have been around Vermont for the last 10 years at the Citizen, the Charlotte News, uh, the Charlotte News, and now my own paper that I started. It's not really technically paper, it's online, but, but you got one. Yeah, is this on? Okay, great. Uh, hi, my name is Maggie Cassidy. Um, I'm the deputy managing editor at VT Digger, although we didn't overlap uh, during our time there, but uh, I think I've been there for maybe three or four months, so uh, still pretty new. Um, before that, I worked at the Valley News, which is a daily newspaper. Uh, in the Upper Valley covering, uh, uh, you know, Lebanon and White River at our core and working our way outward. Um, I was there for nine years, including the past couple as the editor. Um, and uh, before that, um, my earliest sort of journalism experiences, my dad was an editor at our local daily, so I spent a long time sort of hanging out at that newspaper, waiting for him to be done with work, hanging out with the dog, hanging out with my brother, typing stuff on keyboards that didn't make any sense, so uh, been in newsrooms for a while. Hi, I'm Art Cohen, and uh, I'm the editor of the Storm Lake Times in Northwest Iowa, and uh, uh, work at daily and weekly newspapers in Ames, Mason City, and Alcon, Iowa, and uh, <clears throat> helped my brother John start the Storm Lake Times in 1990. And, uh, and of course, they made a movie about it. <laughs> so uh, that's why I'm here. And uh, I really want to thank everybody for all their hospitality. It's a, it's a great town. And so I told you to meet all my colleagues from, from Vermont's Free Press. Hi, I'm John McRae. I'm the news editor of the Aston Independent. If you live in Midbury, you know the newspaper. If you are from out of town, it's the county newspaper that serves uh, 23 Towns in Aston County, Brandon. Been doing this for over 16 years. Um, before that, I worked for a high tech publication in Boston, covering the IT industry for corporations. Um, worked a couple other places and uh, started my journalism career with the Boston with a uh, Hardwick Zet in Hardwick, Vermont, in the Northeast Kingdom, uh, not too far from where Jasper grew up. Um, and uh, I guess I'm here because I'm a local guy. I'm Mark Johnson. I've worked in Vermont journalism since 1982. I worked at the um, Springfield Eagle Times. I went and worked at the Burlington Free Press. Hosted a radio talk show for 25 years. Worked at Vermont Digger for five, including with um, Jasper, um, one of the best reporters I've ever worked with. And now I am a columnist at Seven Days. Great. Um, so I sort of view this as a, a free-flowing discussion. I, I would love if everyone could just sort of share some some thoughts about the film. Um, you know, for me, uh, I think that our, you really sort of are uh, our, our journalism distilled in so many ways. And you know, I uh, it, 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 from sort of you know the salty language, the cigarettes, the long nights, you know, the, the like. The, the hard work, the, 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 the poor pay, I mean, it's, I think the film just is so um, perfect in that, you know, you as a character really exemplify journalism and, uh, you know, also the, the, the breadth of your work is amazing too. You, you won the 2017 Pulitzer Prize for taking on big agriculture. Um, but what's so great about the film is that it also, it's really just a love letter to sort of the day-to-day -day local journalism, you know? The, 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 the pig princess and the, the beauty contest and agriculture and farming issues and 
local sports. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion about local news and its importance. And, um, you know, I think a lot of that sort of stays on the surface. And what the film does so well is it really goes deep and shows sort of how these simple stories, this sort of constant presence in the community keeps the community strong, it humanizes people, it, 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 it creates topics of discussion among people who may not agree all the time. Um, and so, you know, there's clearly struggle in, in, in you know, what you're doing. And, um, you know, I think uh, before some of the other panelists talk about their experiences in local news, I would love, um, you know, sort of a bit of a, a bit of an explanation of why you're doing it. I mean, clearly it's just tough work. It breaks you down. You're, you know, you, you never know what's going to happen. Um, and so, you know, why, why are you still doing it? <laughs> well, it's better than some of shoes. Uh, and, and it's a lot of fun, you know. Uh, I got a soapbox where I can spout off my opinions to people. And, you know, some read it. And uh, so it's a lot of fun. It still is. You know, after I started in 1979, and uh, the first story I wrote was when a tornado destroyed a th about a third of Alabama, Iowa, and killed four people. That was my baptism of wind. And so, you know, that was very exciting and tragic, of course, but uh, exciting and uh, thrilling. And it just, you know, I got in my blood and I can't get it out. And how's the paper doing? Well, we had a decent July. We broke even in July. That's, that's a victory. And, uh, uh, but, you know, for the first six months of the year, we had lost about $20,000. And, uh, you know, we were up. And so I went, I went off the payroll in, uh, in April uh, to, and took early Social Security. So now both my brother, who was really the de facto publisher, and me, I'm publisher in name only, uh, are both working for free. <laughs> and, uh, but we don't, you know, neither of us golf, so. And fortunately, uh, a friend of mine from Carroll, Iowa, about an hour south of Stormlight, another family owned newspaper, twice a week newspaper, just like ours. And I put our heads together and said, you know, advertising has dried up during this pandemic. We've got to do something. And the only thing we could think of was to pass around the tin cup. And so we started something called the Western Iowa Journalism Foundation. Uh, and because we've raised over $50,000 so far for a collection of family-owned independent community newspapers in Western Iowa, which is the most rural part of the state, <laughs> in a rural state. Uh, and so fortunately, we just got a check recently for $15,000 through that foundation, which, you know, now, now we're only five grand in the hole. So I think we're going to make it. I think we will. Great, great. Um, could everybody else uh, maybe just sort of briefly talk about the outlets they work for, where they stand financially, and sort of what, what role they, they play in the community? Why don't we start with you, Chip? Um, so, I was previously the editor at the Charlotte News, and, um, which is a nonprofit and has been around for decades, and um, had a little bit of a difference of opinion about some things um, with that board, so I left in a bit of a huff. But <laughs> I, did, I didn't mean to. It's a to familiar <laughs> story in journalism. <laughs> I know. I told my friend, I said, I didn't imagine that dramatically quitting my job would cause such an uproar, but it did. Um, and then, luckily, there were some journalists who are like, nationally known journalists who lived in Charlotte who had moved here over the past, past few years. And so they helped me start my own online, um, I still call it a paper. I mean, in my mind, it's a paper. Um, but so we have, I have, I've been doing it since May. I think are beginning of June, and we have over a thousand subscribers, which I think is a lot for a town of three thousand people. Um, and by we, I mean mostly me, because I do all the stuff. But um, financially, I mean, we are set up as a nonprofit, so um, we have no money. <laughs> I make uh, really, I don't 
don't know. Maybe I pay for the groceries or something with my salary. But um, but as Art said, I'm, I'm not in it to rake in the big bucks. I don't I don't think that's really a motivating factor. But the thing you need for an organization to keep going is money. So we're working on some fundraising projects that hopefully will keep us going for looking for like a six month window to stay afloat every six months. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess maybe the place I would start is just for my past year, it's been, you know, half or a little bit more than half values and uh, now digger. So I can talk a little bit about both because I think the fundraising thing is very interesting. Um, and uh, the values had some experience with that. But sort of the two, the two sides of my coin have been working at a, you know, traditional daily newspaper where as editor I had to cut positions um, and, you know, we were, uh, you know, still putting out a great product, and I think to this day, but, you know, shrinking. Um, and during the pandemic, we had some success with the fundraiser. We actually had a lot of success with the fundraiser, and I'm hopeful, maybe we can talk about that more. I'm hopeful that um, the Valley News and other papers um, can keep learning those kinds of lessons and, and keep doing. Um, you know, making greater support a bigger piece of the pie. Um, at Digger, I think that's been built into the DNA. Um, Digger is growing. Um, I don't, I don't have exact specifics on financials, but um, you know, my position was a new position. Um, we've added to the reporting staff in the short time that I've been here in terms of positions. Um, and I think being a nonprofit, you know, born digital, sort of. Um, knowing that we're going to count um, on reader donations even though we're free and you know also grants and things of that nature um, more so than the sort of traditional advertising business model has allowed me to see sort of both sides of that of that coin just in a in a short time uh the as independent anyone who um uh, follows us knows that we were a twice weekly newspaper and we'd like to be again we had a Thursday and, and had a Monday edition. When the pandemic came along, advertising went poof. Um, and we just didn't, and also events and you know people getting together went poof. There was some less news and even less advertising. Um, so we went down to once a week. We do a broadsheet on Thursdays. Um, we do also a uh, tab on Mondays, which was also fun, getting a different size of paper every week, uh, twice a week. Um, uh, people were in the community were really responsive when we put out a call for just money um, when the pandemic happened uh, and you know just came through with gifts which was great um, there's only so often you can go you can do that you can't cry pandemic more than once a generation probably um, uh, PPP loans were uh, or, or one at least was was very helpful um, there were some people who, who worked for free for a while um, although that's not sustainable either um, you know, I think that the model for the business model for journalism is changing uh, you know, completely. Um, I think we'll probably have to do more soliciting of, of just money from people, um, whether foundations or individuals. Um, you know, everyone gives a little bit, or a couple people give a lot. Um, that has been figured out. Um, uh, there is in a work in the works a foundation like Art is working on or has created. Um, there's one for New England newspapers that's being worked on and hopefully it will come to fruition soon. Um, and people who want to you know, give money to support local journalism uh, in New England will be able to do that as well with the nonprofit status and also tax deductible. Um, and I think a community news uh, organization is extremely important for building, um, for keeping society healthy. Uh, if you watch the movie, and hopefully you'll have If you haven't, please do. It shows why it's important. Um, the filmmakers were incredible in the way they um, didn't just have our talking, but actually put it in context why um, what they talk about knits people together. Um, so I think there needs to be a business model that works for um, for community journalism, and I, I think it will be. I worked at the Free Press in the mid '80s to late '80s, and I saw Steve Terry here. He'll know this. Um, it was a packed newsroom. I think the daily circulation was 50,000, 55,000 on the weekend. Probably about 10,000 now. But more importantly, there was an entire section of classified ads, and that was just that was where all the money was. And for Gannett, the Burlington Free Press was a huge producer. 
that whole model has completely changed. Um, when I worked for Ken Squire, he made a little bit of money by um, being one of the thriftiest people that I have ever worked for. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and the Lynn family um, it has a, is, a, is, I think, a great model for um, how, it, how it really in St. Albans was and still is to this day in, in Middlebury. Um, my, probably the most experience I have is watching the Digger model because I really was there in the growth period that I would describe where it went from a mash unit to a full-fledged hospital um, where there were really just a couple of us in the newsroom to where now I think it's the biggest newsroom in, in the state. And I think, I think really the model they have is where um, this is all going. It's a nonprofit, uh, unlike Gannett or even the uh, Operation Seven Days that I work for. It, there's, a, there's a lot of goodwill out there. There are a lot of people that want a place like Digger to succeed. I think they came in at a, at a time when um, a number of the newspapers were really cutting back, so there was a there was just a huge a huge gap to fill. But they have um, done just phenomenally great work. Um, Ann Galloway and the rest of the gang there, uh, you know, philanthropy, grants, donations from readers, and advertising. But unlike the old days, you know, advertising is really not the key. And uh, you know, I'm curious. Uh, seven days where I work now had struggled during the pandemic. I think they too uh, were helped greatly by the PPP loans and set up something called the Friends of Seven Days. But the, the, the problem with that is that there's no um, tax deduction if you make a contribution. So have you figured out a way around that to maintain a for-profit but have a kind of non-profit offshoot? Yeah, we actually got uh, approved by the IRS as a 501c3 or whatever it is for a nonprofit. And so then there's an independent board of directors. Uh, so I don't know who's giving money or anything like that. Uh, and then they give out grants, for example, agriculture and climate reporting or education reporting. And essentially it covers our report salaries. All right, I, I had a quick question. In the film, you talk, uh, you and your brother talk about how, you know, uh, ads were drying up, you know, sort of the mom and pop grain wholesalers, they're not around anymore. And, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a scene where you see sort of a Tyson ad going in the paper. And I wonder... Not anymore. Yeah, well, I was going to ask. I wonder if Tyson or any of these other multinationals pulled back because of your coverage. Yes. And, uh, Tyson doesn't advertise with us anymore. And, uh... Not even the other one. Wow. And uh, because they were pissed about our uh, coverage of the COVID crisis. And uh, our also fairly blistering editorials and probably deserve to lose their ass. So, but you know, it's kind of liberating, really, being broke. So, you know, I'm getting to the age where I can say whatever I want. I'm getting there anyway. And, um, yeah, and, you know, the Farm Bureau, which is the biggest cultural and political organization in Iowa, um, and, and they also own a huge insurance company. Uh, they won't spend a dime with us. So yeah, yeah, so whatever ag advertising we ever had any hope of, we aren't gonna get because we keep attacking the ag chemical supply chain. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think there's, we haven't really seen this yet, but there, I think there is a danger or a weakness in the nonprofit model in that at the end of the day, a lot of the people giving money are wealthy, powerful interests. I mean, clearly we see, you know, obviously the Washington Post isn't a nonprofit, um, but Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. And that, I'm sure, creates tension in sort of how, how uh, journalists operate. I mean, there, there is a, a, a wall between the business and the journalistic side, the same goes with these nonprofits. Um, but you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if some issues um, start uh, percolating around that. Well, I can speak to that. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. <laughs> we so when I started the Charlotte Bridge, we decided that I mean, a, a woman that is on my board of directors says she thinks we're the first paper in the country to have done this, but I'm not sure um, if that's exactly true. So I, I want to 
want to put an asterisk next to that. I don't. But um, so we have on our website our whole bank account. You could log into it right now, and you can look and see every transaction we made. You can see when my salary goes into my direct deposit. You can see and. Along with that, you can see every donation we get, who it's from, and how much money they gave. And um, I think from an integrity point of view, that was really important to us, and that we were like, this needs to happen right away. There are 3,000 people in Charlotte, maybe a little more. Like, it, it, everybody is related to somebody, or was married to somebody, or someone was someone's elementary school teacher. Like, And I connected with you on that, like just watching the movie. You know, you, if, if you don't know everybody, they probably know who you are, right? And so there has to be, for me, there needed to be that line between, like, you know, any perception at all that we were doing anything that was being influenced by somebody who's giving money. Interestingly enough, there have been donors who gave much less money than they would have had it not been that public information that we were openly sharing with people. And have said as such, have said, well, I might have given more, but I was a little worried about what people would think. And um, I try to stay away from the fundraising, because it's not my job. But anyway, it was, it was interesting that somebody would kind of articulate that, right? Like, Yeah, I mean, if anyone else wants to talk about that, feel free. I mean, I know that when I was a digger, there were times where we were writing stories that were, you know, raising concerns with some of the donors, not to name names. I mean, and, and any good editor, they know who they are, and they're not going to buckle to those right. people. But but there is now this new sort of form of pressure that is exerting on the newsroom, and and you know I think again the the vast majority of good reporters will resist that. But well, people used to accuse us of uh, uh, carrying water for Tyson because we uh, uh, we ran hot wanted ads, and uh, you know it's going to I explode at and start swearing, and yeah. but so anyway. You know, it doesn't affect us at all, you know, but you, you could say that we're not going to go out and attack Citizens First National Bank, uh, which has our loan, you know, that, that affects, you know, that's where my ethics stop. <laughs> it's good to have a lot. <laughs> and so, we're, you know, they own us already, and, and, uh, and like I said, I don't know who's giving money to this the Western Iowa Journalism Foundation, and I don't want to know. And, uh, but, you know, anybody who has an ad in the paper could be expected that they're going to, uh, you know, that you'll do a little story about their, their new business product, you know, and we're sure going to do it. You bet we will. <laughs> yeah, I mean, surely it's not a perfect model, but it's the best out there. I'm sure some of you guys read a story a few months ago about I think it was called the Epoch Times, which was sort of this like supposedly local newspaper that was cropping up in all these communities. Turned out it was this, you know, like might even have like foreign connections. I don't remember all of the the, the the sort of money trails, but really what this was and what a lot of these places are, if you if you um what's that uh what's that like a uh, television company? Sinclair, they also do this. They own all of these news stations locally, and they're sort of pumping this political message that is certainly swayed by the, the people at the top. It's sort of like, you know, like a Fox News um, sort of at the local level. This, this is happening. And so, you know, if there aren't really strong, vibrant, local community news organizations that can push back on that and find the conversation, then, you know, I think these these other sort of astroturf interests risk sort of taking over a community. Um, you know, I think the film uh, really, uh, really just beautifully demonstrates also how local news when done right percolates up to the national level you know and and and, and also national news um, needs to be contextualized by local reporters otherwise it's sort of vague and it can be misconstrued um, and you know I mean when, when everyone uh, when all the presidential candidates were kissing your ring at the you know Iowa <laughs> political forum I, I was like you know Elizabeth Warren wouldn't know how many cents a farmer gets per dollar if it wasn't for Art Cullen and the respect that he holds in the community. And so, you know, I mean, that just sort of got me thinking about my time in local news and, you know, all of the stories where it did feel like there was some sort of impact where, you know, it, it didn't have to be some massive investigation, but, but we're just sort of surfacing information um, really brought a positive benefit to the community. I wonder if anyone on the panel wants to talk about sort of 
experiences they've had. Uh, so move ahead. It just made me think that when, when uh, Art, is this on? Uh, when Art, uh, you may have to, we can, uh, you can have mine. Mm -hmm. cool. That's really good to shout. Oh yeah, yeah, here you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, when Art uh, had, had numbers that he could uh, say about how much the farmer and whatever, that takes a lot of work. Um, and not everyone's going to do it, and someone who's doing a national story might do it on a national stage, but Art's going to do it in, in uh, Western Iowa and maybe across Iowa and maybe across the Midwest. Um, that's the role. one benefit of a, uh, community journalism is you get the information out there that it's just not going to exist. I mean, there's, there's information and it's, it's data around, but it's gathered together in a community newspaper as information that people can understand and put in context, like Jasper mentioned. Um, and that's a real value of community journalism. Uh, it's just, it actually creates information. Um, like I said, information, the, the stuff is out there, but it's not information until it goes through Art's brain, or Mark's, or, or Maggie's, or any, anyone here. Um, and that's a one value of community newspapers. When you're talking about uh, uh, nonprofit status before, and how you have to, uh, uh, put your your um, your salary online. Um, that was shocking to me. I can't imagine that. Um, People are shocked by it. Not oh, a good yeah. way. <laughs> well, I can just imagine that when you uh, when your car gets really old and you have three kids and uh, you know your circumstances changes, you're going to need more money. And if you put that online, people are going to start. Well, why does she need that much more money now? Um, it just I mean, it creates a, like a story in its own, which just seems you know they don't ask why the the President of the National Bank of Middlebury gets a raise or, a, or gets you know their, their salary cut. Um, so why would I, me as a, a you know a newspaper editor at a, a nonprofit news source want my uh, salary out there? That just seems really weird to me. Um, I like it just causing unnecessary talk um, in town. Um, was that something you were worried about? Well. I mean, well, first of all, there's lots of unnecessary talk in town, anyway. <laughs> and that's how, I find, that's how I find things out. But also, I, I think the spirit of it when I started it was that it just, I was going to be fully transparent about everything. Yeah. And we will put, I know the seven days it does this, and I'm sure Vermont Digger does too. When we write a story about, like, let's say the Planning Commission, and then I put a little note at the bottom, and one of the, the planning commissioners is married to somebody on the board and then we just have this disclaimer and it's almost funny when you read it because it's like I live next door to the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the zoning board and like you know what I mean? That, I, I, What's that dinner with? Yeah, I, but I kind of want to be almost over the top with it. Just to, to be, listen, this, not many people live here. Oh, Everyone knows everyone's business. Yeah. So you know what, I'm going to let you know. No one's, no one's going to be a... Uh, Wondering about my new car, I'm gonna have like a Flintstones car, and they're gonna say why. It's gonna be because of, you know, they can go check our bank account. I guess I've dealt with enough, enough, enough phone calls from people who ask unreasonable questions, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just part of the job, but it's, uh, it's, yeah. it, it's kind of a fun part of the job, frankly, to see how people, how differently some people think. Um, but uh, it just seems like a, an extra uh, wrinkle that is, you know, be hard to yeah. deal with. Yeah. And Silicon Hat, the uh, morning register, they used to publish the uh, salaries of all their executives every year. And so uh, uh, I was thought that was uh, you know a good concept for me. And I was envy of it. You know, because I was, you know, living on macaroni and cheese. <laughs> Can, does anyone want to talk about what the sort of squeeze on journalism, on local journalism, uh, what what that's done to how they operate, how they work, you know, whether it's, I mean, maybe it's sort of created a new way of operating that's beneficial, but I'm sure it's also sort of restricted things. I mean, Mark, you obviously sort of, you had some years in the heyday when the money was flowing. Can you just talk a little bit about maybe how the work changed? Well, as I say, you know, the newsroom at the Burlington Free Press probably had 12 reporters. Um, I'm guessing they might have half that today. I think actually a, a good example of what can happen is um, at, up in St. Albans. Uh, uh, Angelo's brother, Emerson, uh, owned the St. Albans Messenger, a really just a fantastic small town newspaper, um, and some really great journalism coming out of there. They were 
when the Water Quality Act was passed, um, Governor Shumlin highlighted their coverage. They you know, just really did some, they were sort of one of those papers that was really just a cut above. Um, you know, Emerson has these great editorials. And it was, it was purchased by a group that I think has um, good intentions, but is just sort of not the model that I think we want to strive for which is, um, it's, it's gone from six days a week publication of print down to two. I think, frankly, the world of print, nobody will be doing print in five years. But what's important is what you put on the internet. And I think you can put really high quality journalism on the internet, but there's also this temptation to put on um, the cotton candy and to put on things like the top five um, most expensive homes on the market for sale in the area. That, that to me is just, that's not news. And there's a, there's a phrase called, um, we, there are news deserts where communities just don't have anybody covering them. But then there are communities where there is a publication that's there that kind of, um, is, they're called them ghosts. And they're providing coverage of some kind but it's, um, it's, it's just not covering the selectmen's meetings. It's not going to the court hearings. It's not doing kind of the bread and butter stuff that newspapers depend on. So, you know, my worry is that we'll go that way and it'll all be about getting you to click on um, their site and, um, you know, in the, in the process, uh, running, you know, with a newsroom that's half the size of what it used to be. And, and you know, the free press does a lot of this same stuff, too, where, um, you know, top five events at the Champlain Valley Fair, um, you know, so. I, I think that, you know, whether it's um, digital or print, I, I do think that that kind of, you know, the, the clickbait kind of stuff that you're talking about, the listicles and things like that, I think that there can be as much pressure on that, frankly, to get into print as a digital if your newsroom is shrinking. So I don't know that it's a uniquely digital problem, and I think it's the kind of thing to look out for if your newsroom is, uh, if, you're, if you're cutting back, um, whether it's digital or print. I think what we were trying to do um, at the Valley News and the uh, COVID put a lot of pressure on this idea was to um, sort of pick our punches and you know, you were asking about if your newsroom is shrinking and if your resources are shrinking, how do you deal with that? To sort of like cut out sort of some of the daily grind, um, really low hanging fruit and try to roll those into broader stories and roll them into things where we're talking about bringing in context for a community and things like that. So, you know, sort of like writing up, you know, the cop slaughter um, for some quick hits on, you know, the crimes of the day trying to let that go. Now, we didn't do a ton of that before, but really trying to, you know, applying that to any type of coverage and trying to do as little of that as possible. And the trick is how to keep track of it if you're not writing about it, to then say, well, you know, the trend is that, oh, I think I'm gone. Here you go. <laughs> the trend is that, uh, so that you can report on the trend so that you can, you can give that bigger picture and so that when you are writing stories, they, they're broader and have a bigger impact. It sounds really good. It's harder to do in practice, and especially when something like COVID comes along and then everything is important. There's just like this incredible you know, spout of news that is all vitally important to get out to readers for like a you know, health crisis really sort of turns that, that on its head, but that was you know, some of what that was some of our thinking, at least. Can I say something about COVID you mentioned? Um, just that uh, you know, everything was important with COVID. You know, I've been in the news business for 20 years when COVID hit, and it, it still kind of struck me as like every day, even weekly, weekly paper came in every day, there was COVID news, and it was all really important. Um, and it was all really local, too. I mean, nationally, it was scary as hell, but, but locally, it's like, how you can react? So that fired our, our, our journalism but uh, it, you know, it also was, was just a, an anomaly. It was just, it was, you know, you, you cover a city council meeting and sometimes they're interesting, sometimes they're not. Um, but everything was interesting for COVID for the first year. Um, it's less interesting now just because we've done it so much, but uh, that was an amazing news story. Totally. Yeah, it still is.
I would say that the council meetings also sort of fall into that in terms of, you know, the Valley News used to have a bigger presence, I think, at like every select board meeting or city council meeting for some of our core towns and trying to sort of like keep ears on that without sort of the daily grind is, you know, another example of what we were trying to do. Can't give a plug for a, a movie. There's a film being shown on Saturday morning here. Um, actually, I think it's sure the marquee, but part of the film festival um, about a city council in, in Virginia where there was a, a huge meeting last uh, a year ago, July, which just blew up. Um, the city manager started accusing the mayor of things. The mayor resigned. People accused, accused different city council mem members of things. That was just a meeting. Uh, it was a meeting that just went crazy and it still affected Virginia a year later and, and a sharp filmmaker in town decided to make a documentary about it and the impact of it. Um, so that's an example of how it was a local story that are very crucial to people in Virginia and you know, people can learn from it for their own, own cities. So it's a Saturday morning in uh, the marquee looking at you. Program. And I, you know, I would add. I think there's a big difference between um, a paper like what uh, what what our friend here works at, much smaller than. I mean, you're really a statewide operation, so you can't really get down into each community. But I think you're right. You have to figure out a way to be following these. As is there is there a trend going on um, throughout the state? And I, I think one of the, the smart things that happened during the period of time that Jasper and I were at Digger was that we started actually reducing the number of stories per day because there were some days where uh, there were 12, 13 stories that were coming out. Pretty much now, uh, it seems as though it's pretty much stuck with it that there are eight stories a day. And that's a, that's a lot of work that goes into that. But I think what the cumulative effect positive for the reader by cutting back on it is it gave each reporter much more time to do a story that was much more valuable in, in the end. So there's that, that balance between immediacy of a, you know, a, a, a police shooting in Rutland last night versus a long-term trend of is the Green Mountain Care Board actually being effective? I actually have a question for Art. Um, it just, when he just said that um, he thought most newspapers would be online in five years, I wonder what you think about that because um, I had a hard time giving up the print. It, it, I don't know, it's just something about it, getting it in your mailbox and stuff, and, and you just, even the visual, you know, the movie of the people delivering the papers and looking at their ads and stuff, it's like, it's that tactile paper still probably, especially for you and your, in your blood. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, five years might be aggressive, uh, uh, you know, we, they have, you know, we have old readers who demand print, and you know, our TV section, our TV section, we still have it because we, you know, they're important to us, and we can't lose them, and uh, until they die, you know, and then we lose them. And uh, so, the Minneapolis Star Tribune believes that print is a very important part of their. Uh, uh, publishing equation, and they're one of the most successful uh, uh, regional publishers in the country. Uh, and so, I, you know, print is still a very important part of the formula, obviously, though. You know, when do you ever see anybody reading a print newspaper in public? I, I never do, ever. And, uh, you know, you, could, you can't, can't buy the Chicago Tribune at O'Hare, so, or the Wall Street Journal. Well, seven days still does a Wednesday print edition, and then there's a almost a daily ongoing um, internet presence. And uh, I'm I'm really interested to see how how long that continues because I agree with you. I think people that are older, um, and I'm now in that category. You know, you, it's it's romantic. You like reading a newspaper. But you know, people are on, they're glued to the phone and that's the delivery system. And you know, it's almost as though the sooner that you join that, um, the better off you're gonna be. And part of it is, you know, the, 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 I think people are so impatient. You know, we've, we've provided ways that there's this immediacy of news. Um, you know, I write a column that used to be in a print publication before there was the internet. And you know now people barely have the patience to read a Twitter feed. You know, I think I think we've really done something to ourselves um, 
you know, with these phones. The, the, the Atlantic has a has a uh, app that you can subscribe to. And one of the things that they do is they tell you before, at the top of the article, they say, average time to read seven minutes. And you know, my first reaction was, God, this is like the sign of the apocalypse. I mean, really? You know, but then I thought, well, you know, maybe that will get people to, if you say, all right, so I've got to invest five minutes, I'll, I'll do that. Maybe that will get people to read. I don't know whether that's successful or not, but I thought, wow. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of journalists are really nostalgic for print, and there's no better feeling than seeing your name in print. I remember the first time I was in the print edition of the Boston Globe, I would go in at 6 a.m. To, to help put the papers at the desk when I was an intern. I literally, like, started crying. Like, it was just such a powerful experience. But I think beyond that, I mean, I think the experience of reading a newspaper is very beneficial because it's an exploratory process. You are there in this world, you are finding stories that you would not seek out. I mean, for instance, reading the New York Times print edition, you read all of this international coverage that I never seek out on Twitter or Google or anything like that. And, and, and so it really creates a rounded news viewer who, who sort of knows what's going on in many different areas. So I, I think there's a real benefit to it. Of course, yeah. We're all, all of our attention is shot, and that's tragic. And there's certainly, uh, you know, elements of online journalism that are pathbreaking and interesting. I mean, I guess I would sort of ask that question: Is do any of you guys see promise in online journalism? I mean, are there things that have that 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 you know you're really happy to have these new tools online? The spelling bee. <laughs> The New York Times. The New York Times. Oh, the Spelling Bee. Yeah, yeah. I heard that app. Yeah. I heard about spell check. No. <laughs> I was like, that was before the internet. I think. <laughs> it's because it tells you you're a genius every day when you get it. Who doesn't yeah, need that app? By 7 a.m. <laughs> There's actually a, a state senator here in Addison County um, whose husband, I believe, teaches at Middlebury, who I follow on Twitter. I don't know if any of you do the New York Times Spelling Bee, but they give you seven letters and there's one in the middle and you have to use the one in the middle and make combinations of words. Well this guy, every day, there's a level of genius but then there's beyond genius where you get every word you get your queen bee for the day. This guy is queen bee every day. And he has these comments and I'm sure he's a really nice guy but I, I will say, you know, I. I, I got to Queen Bee before my second cup of coffee. And you just, you know. And, and the other day, there were, it then tells you, because he has the Queen Bee, how many words there actually are, which when you do it normally, you're guessing into an unknown. And I was up till 10.30 trying to get the last word from three or four days ago because this guy put it up there. Did you get it? Sorry. No, it was a Tom Tit. It's a bird, which I, I, I missed. There's a scene in the film art where your son is eating with you and he says, you know, Dad, I think you should really uh, start a podcast. And you basically say, no fucking way. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, I mean, sure, should you be the person on the podcast? Maybe not. But, and, and you know, I mean, there's all of these new ideas out there, you know, as someone who came up in journalism, after the 2008 financial crash, after all the papers lost their money, you know, people were just constantly grabbing for ideas. We're going to pivot to video, then we're going to pivot back to print, then we're going to pivot back to video, then we're going to, you know, do podcasts, then we're going to do visuals, then we're going to do slideshows. All of these ideas, and a lot of them haven't panned out, frankly. You know, and I, I get the, I understand where you're coming from, wanting to sort of stick to the bread and butter. Um, but as you look at the future of the newspaper, I don't know if your son is committed to taking it over, but what are you feeling? I mean, where, how would, do you have a plan for how it could step into the future? Um, well, I think the future is obviously digital and more interactivity, uh, although, uh, you know, sometimes that can create a Frankenstein and you get readers too involved in making these <laughs> malicious remarks and comments and stuff, and we don't have time to edit them all. Uh, so, no, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting a little, too old and I'm still a little light, uh, but I just, uh, you know, I can't foretell what's going to happen. And uh, um, and I, just, I, I think it's time to turn things over to Tom. And, uh, but it's, 
it's really difficult to, for him to buy the paper when you know you're losing money. <laughs> and, uh, well, so, you keep working for free. Yeah, well, or I'll keep working for free. So anyway, uh, but I think we've got him suckered into it, and uh, based on romantic appeals uh, to you know his patriotism and to the family and all that. So I, you know, but I think they're uh, like Mark was saying there. I think uh, you know. They're going to find a way. The Vermont Diggers find a way. The Texas Tribunes find a way, and uh, and Tom will find a way. Yeah. And so I'm counting on it. Otherwise, we're really screwed. We'll never get our money back. <laughs> you know, I, I, would, I would just say I think Vermont Digger, um, you know, they have podcasts like Doherty, and David Goodman does a show that they rebroadcast. I I would dare say that's really popular. So I think you can have these. It can also be a really a distraction, I think, from reporting. You know, when you when you spend your time fiddling around with podcasts and videos, all the other things you listed, I, I think it can distract from your bread and butter and what you're supposed to be doing. I think. But, I mean, Digger is. But I don't listen to them either. That's yeah. the problem. Where Digger is lucky in that there's. I mean, Mike pretty much does podcasts full time. He's not really reporting out there. So. Well, he is reporting too. Oh, I mean, he is. Yeah. Of course, but you know, he. I think he has a lot of bandwidth to focus. On. Right. I mean, the, I think the difference is that part of our bread and butter includes the podcast. It's not. It's. It's not a distraction or an addition or something separate. It's you know all all together in the same you know, pan. Um, and so that's, that's, I think, what makes it work. Um, you know, he's doing, he's doing reporting for his podcast. He's very talented. He's turning that into text stories. He's turning it into podcasts. So he's able to sort of do a lot. But to have the, the roster that Digger has in terms of, you know, looking up and down how many people you have, you, you can do a lot with that. Um, and so that's, you know, in a lot of ways, um, a real luxury, a real privilege, you know, whatever, to be able to, to have to have that kind of a newsroom. I was going to say on a print thing uh, that, so this is uh, one of my first times in Middlebury, um, and I came up today, I live in White River, and uh, two of our interns currently are Middlebury students, and their Digger articles had been reprinted in the Valley News, so I kind of broke into the Valley News last night and got a couple copies of the print edition because when I had told them previously that their stories had appeared in print, they were, you know, over the moon. You know, they were so excited that um, that their stories had showed up in print. So I do think that that still says something. Maybe we romanticize it. Maybe there's some nostalgia. But I do think, you know, even as, as a person who moved from a print product to a digital product, I think that there is power in print. I, 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 you know, you might be right. I, I hope maybe not in five years. But I, I like to think about the things that there are a lot of things that the web can do that print cannot. That are that are pretty evident um, in terms of just you know video and podcasts and, and the technology. But I do think that there are some things that print can do that we've all already talked about that maybe we haven't totally as an industry nailed yet, um, talking about sort of slowing down and thinking about the news holistically um, and thinking about it edited, you know, what we're all trying to do um, as sort of a daily report as opposed to sort of siloed, you know, dispatches sending out that are trying to get your attention and get you to spend three minutes off of Twitter or whatever. So I, I think those kinds of things and just physically being in a community having, you know, boxes and, uh, you know, um, uh, delivery to homes and seeing the bags and seeing the boxes and everything, having that physical presence, um, you know, I don't, I don't count that out in terms of a, uh, a real benefit and in terms of being in a community. Yeah, ask a question? Oh, this phone, this isn't a phone, but it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, last night, Art made a comment about the importance of investigative reporting. And local newspapers are especially positioned, maybe even especially threatened by the possibilities of investigative reporting, but it creates an energy and a dynamic in a community that can have impact. So I'd just like people to maybe comment on their own views of the importance of investigative reporting, the popularity of it, the challenges, and the impact. Uh, investigative reporting is, is very important. Um, I think much reporting is investigative 
Um, it's the degree, depends on the degree you're going to investigate. Um, if you're going to go in here, ask the, uh, the school board chairman, you know, what's up with this, and they say something that they maybe didn't intend to, you follow up on it, and it's not a major thing, but it's something that reveals an aspect of what's going on in the schools that wouldn't have been if you hadn't been reported there to ask the question. So, you know, that's investigative. Um, if the school board chair says something, and you go back and, and dig into some minutes from the last meeting or whatever, and you find out more about it, that's more investigation. And then you dig into financial records and go back years, and that's even deeper. Um, we don't always have the time to do that, but um, as a manager, I find when I have a reporter who's interested in it, I let them go, because because if they're excited about it, there's probably a reason their uh, their excitement will go to the readers, and um, it, it will probably have an impact on what's going on in the, in the community. Um, beyond what a person could have if they just went to the meeting and happened to sit through it. Um, so I, I, I think it's really important, like Art said, um, but I think you have to have to see it in a spectrum of investigation. You know, it, obviously it's, it's really important, but it's expensive and it's a big commitment. Um, Jasper and I worked on a series, he did a seven part series about the Vermont National Guard called the Flying Fraternity. And I think we worked on that together for what you did all the reporting and I helped with the editing. It was probably six months, right? I mean, uh, so that was a huge commitment. My concern is that newspapers that are much smaller don't have that kind of luxury to do. Um, as I say, bigger, as I think probably the largest newsroom right now and could afford to, to do that. Um, but wow, uh, you know, that's, it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult commitment to make. There's a question up in the back. Yeah, just, uh, Shay, you want to say something on that? Yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, it's hard to balance those things, right? Because you want people to keep reading every week. And also at the same time, I sort of got a reputation now in town of being a pain in the ass because I'm poking into things and asking people questions. And not always super popular, and luckily I don't care that much. But like, also, I think those are the things that people really want to read, and I think that it's worth the time and and the the investment of, of your character and your and your late nights and all those meetings and watching the the reviews and stuff. But I think it's not always um, people read it. They're not always you'll maybe get like a bunch more like angry emails, but it's I think. Everybody sitting here, probably that's like the most thrilling thing of all, right? Like that's the thing that you keep going back and doing what you're doing and what I think essentially people want to read, right? Yeah. Question up there. Thank you. Uh, could you each address, I don't know, I perceive a sort of a slippage of editorial perspective uh, into what I guess we call hard news for a better term. Could you address how, uh, how that's dealt with within your publications? Uh, and, and also, whether you think your, your readership is more interested in hard news, or is it your bias or perspective, editorial perspective, that, uh, that that's the draw uh, of your readership? Yep, why not? Uh, <laughs> over the course of my career, I think the, uh, the idea that uh, journalists are completely unbiased and, um, and look, put one side up against the other, um, has slowly decayed, and uh, most journalists understand that they have a perspective um, now, and that they bring it to their stories. Um, that said, if I had a, a reporter, and I have had plenty of interns who will bring in a perspective that's uninformed um, and nature, and that that can happen. Um, so the role of the editor then is to is to balance things out by saying, you know, be fair, um, be complete. Um, use facts, um, and if there is more than one side of something, you know, get perspective on those things as well. Um, a couple of my reporters have been doing it for decades, and then, then I have some interns and then one reporter who haven't been doing it for very long. Um, so we do, you know, they can learn from each other. I think, frankly, the older guys learn from the younger ones how to get excited about new things and new perspectives. Um, but uh, as far as the editor, the, the person who writes the editorials in the land, um, imposing his view onto the, um, the news stories, that doesn't happen because we just don't let him. Um, he doesn't try. Uh, 
But is there a is there a crossover between opinion and, and news? We, you know, we try not to, but it, you have to acknowledge that there you come out from your from your background, and some of your background will show in your news stories. I think that speaks also to the importance of a good copy editor or somebody to read your work for you before um, before you send it out there. Because I think the ones that we have, I have a couple of people who volunteer to read those, and they'll let me know. They'll be like, well, you sound a little bit like you favor one thing or the other. And even if I don't necessarily have a strong opinion about it, if they pick up on it, I'm like, okay, I gotta go rewrite that and make sure it's, it's good. Cause the word choice is really important in, in yeah. some stories. Like, yeah. You know, the crucial difference between uh, a more bland verb and a more exciting verb can make a big difference, you know, positively or negatively. Um, you know, too exciting a verb on, on something that you're getting close to the edge, you could tone it down a little bit. Not exciting enough, you like, let's let's put a little fire into this. Yeah, I think I mean there are, you know, a couple thousand decisions that go into every story uh, that is ultimately published on the page. What what stories to do, what questions to ask, how to ask them, what follow-ups, you know, who are you talking to, who are you not talking to? Um, and any range in between. So I agree about a copy editor and, you know, in fact, as many people as possible, you know, uh, being part of a story um, and having, you know, as strong a newsroom as possible with as many diverse perspectives as possible to, you know, uh, be, be putting eyes on those kinds of things and asking those kinds of things, who's included or not, what are we not thinking of, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, 99% of the stuff we do is just straight factual reporting, whether it's a fire, a car accident, um, a birthday, uh, a marriage, um, and uh, there really is no, um, you know, perspective on those stories. And, and that's, you know, really the lion's share of what we do is, is covering city council meetings and school board meetings and so on, uh, and recording what happened. and. Uh, and there, you know, and then uh, occasionally you can do a feature story that where maybe uh, you know the subject pretty well, and you know you can take a level license, and, and uh, so that comes down to judgment and experience. But but you know, for the lion's part of what we do is is uh, is all straight stuff, and we have pretty, you know, we really don't. Uh, you know, we don't allow any opinion on the front page, but, you know, I think Chuck Grassley is a terrible senator. He's, he should retire. Um, but if Chuck Grassley comes to town, we're just going to report what he says and we're going to run his picture. And, uh, and then on the editorial page, I'll uh, bring him a new one. I would, I would say, if I read a new story, I don't want to know what the, I, I want to read the story and have no idea what the reporter's opinion is. That just, um, that to me is really black and white. Uh, I, there is a tendency, I think, among younger, new generation reporters to be, that there's more activism going on out there. And, and I get it. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we've really screwed up. Um, but I, I think that you've got to either be an activist or a reporter, and you leave your activism at the door. Um, and if you're a really good reporter, uh, you know, a lot of it is, you know, I think as Maggie said, I think a lot of the quote-unquote bias of the newspaper is the stories that it even decides to cover. But I think once you cover them, it's got to be fair. And you don't have to have the false equivalence of having somebody uh, talking about the Holocaust and then having a Holocaust denier. I mean, that's, 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 a, that's absurd. But I think there's a, there's a time and a place, and frankly, I will tell you right now, I've been a hard news reporter for 40 years, and now I've been asked to do a column. It's a totally different sport. I look at it, you know, as somebody who knew how to play tennis, and now I'm trying to play golf. Every, my editors want an opinion. They want me to, you know, take it to the hoop and make a conclusion of it. And it's something that I'm working on and getting better at, but it really goes against the grain, but it's a column, it's not a news story. I would also just point out really quickly, I think for Art and Mark both, that you guys both engage in reported editorial writing. You know, I mean, I think there are so many columnists out there 
who sit in their, you know, ivory towers and are totally removed from the world and they sort of get these ideas in their heads that they just throw on the page. And I think that's dangerous and can do a lot of damage. But, you know, I mean, you see art out there talking to the farmers, you know, just really being engaged in all facets of the community and then that informs his opinions. I mean, I think facts and reporting should inform a good editorial. Can I just add one thing that Mark said about activism and younger people is I, I totally agree with that. You know, when I have younger people working for me, um, a, lot, you know, a measure of them want to be active. And um, I'm excited about that because it's getting younger people involved in journalism, which is, is not always very easy, especially when half of them want to go to Wall Street or something. Um, so if I have an activist um, in here, usually sometimes a reporter, um, yeah, I'll go ahead and let them do the activism work when we're talking about it, maybe when they're starting to record it, and then we start to, to shape the story to teach them, well, this is actually the journalism part of it. Is you, you know, it's good that you brought this enthusiasm to it. It's good you found these facts. Let's balance it out. Um, but, so I think that I, I see exactly what you say about younger people and activism, because uh, um, I have them come in pretty regularly. Um, and I, you know, initially resisted, of course, but um, I, I like it now because it, it just gives me play to work with. Because otherwise, I'm, I, you know, I'm just the old people in the room. <laughs> yeah, and I think um, one of the things that maybe we're all grappling with is um, we all stand somewhere. I mean, we mentioned uh, we're not going to uh, write about Holocaust and not areas as it probably they don't deserve any space. You know, it's not worth it. So that's very clear. Um, so we all stand somewhere in terms of making decisions about what stories to cover. Some of some stuff, you know, fires and whatever, it's very clear. Other stuff might be less clear. There might be, you know, how have we covered certain issues um, in the past that, you know, you take a, a look at where you have stood and you thought that you were neutral and say maybe even just by covering it the way that we thought was sort of run of the mill, you know, wasn't as run of the mill as we thought and sort of I think that's sort of where some of the um, maybe younger I might, I might be one of the younger uh, journalists on the stage um, you know are sort of coming from is thinking about what, where is the neutral what what is that point where we have been standing and um, you know what what does that mean and how has that impacted our reporting just one quick um sort of point on, on what you said. That all of these decisions, yeah, they, they are sort of put through someone's personal framing. And, and a good example is one of my friends used to work at a newspaper in North Carolina that was owned by a more conservative uh, family. And she was trying to write about, and, and Art, you might have dealt with this, or maybe you haven't, you probably have better rules in place, but she was trying to speak to exploited immigrant laborers. and the paper would not grant any of them anonymity. There was, no, there was a hard rule where they said, we are not going to include this person's perspective, even though clearly by including their identifying details, that would put their status in jeopardy. And my friend was just incredibly frustrated by this time and again, because there was a clear story of abuse happening. And yet, because of this sort of a rule of objectivity and journalistic standards that was immovable, that story couldn't be told. Um, and, and I do hope that some of those ideas are, are sort of questioned and, and shaken about a bit because I think a lot of times, historically, um, many perspectives have been left out in, in journalism. Um, and I say that as one of uh, an all-white <laughs> panel of journalists. Uh, but Vermont is very white, and that is just, that is just the, way, the way things are. Um, so we're basically coming up on an hour here. Uh, I would just encourage everyone in, on, on this, uh, in this audience to subscribe to at least one newspaper or magazine or give money to public radio. I always harangue all of my friends and say just one. Just one subscription at least. Just do that if you have an audience. Preferably us. Preferably the store. <laughs> I was just going to say you can hack it. Do all of them. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I guess that was just, you can't you can hack it. Yeah. People pay for dumb things all the time. Um, and this isn't dumb, to clarify. This is important, this is vital to democracy.
I guess I would just ask people to share sort of final thoughts on the future of journalism, on where things stand, on what they wish would change, you know, just a sort of a closing, closing thought. Or a favorite story of theirs. Or a favorite story of theirs. Well, I um, I just are such a thrill to meet you. It was so nice that movie was so great, and um, and her aunt and uncle are from Storm Lake. They are. Isn't that crazy? It's and my dad grew up. He was one of seven and grew up where was Cherokee, like twenty minutes away, maybe. Yeah. Like really. So I was I actually went there a bunch when I was a kid. Um, but you know I'm a Vermonter, so it's just kind of wild. But I loved my favorite part. Just everything about that movie was you know your letter to your son at the end and how it was just when that when he was walking around with that gentleman who was running for office and just having that conversation with him and just like scribbling on his pad I was like oh yeah that's what it's all about right and and it was just I just loved it it was really touching it was great to meet you well, um, thanks. <laughs> and uh, and I don't have any good stories just, <laughs> I write them all down I'll put it in the bridge for you <laughs> uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the film as well, and I mentioned the connection, you know, I have a very strong family connection to newspapering, and uh, that that obviously really came through here, and I, I found that to be uh, very nice in terms of sort of my experience and all that, and I guess I hope that, you know, what my experience has been, uh, you know, watching my dad do it, um, he had some schooling on it, but he didn't have a degree. I had some schooling, I also don't have a degree. <laughs> Showing up sort of with a notepad and a pen and just being able to walk in and do the job um, with like a sense of curiosity and just sort of like wanting to learn. So I hope that the future of journalism is a little bit more accessible for people, you know, getting back to where people can just sort of learn how to do it, that there are more opportunities for people to, um, just try, you know, citizen journalism, um, showing up at a paper, getting an internship, whatever, so that we can sort of, you know, grow the ranks that way. Yeah, well, during the pandemic, uh, both local and national publications uh, were seeing some pretty healthy increases in readership. And uh, the New York Times and Washington Post are just going through the roof with new subscriptions. And we saw our circulation base grow pretty substantially because of the pandemic and Trump. And uh, uh, even though, uh, you know, we really don't cover presidential politics, uh, um, people were just more aware of things in civic life generally, and we're getting more engaged, you know, and all the turnout's still low, it was record turnout in the last presidential election. And, and so, uh, and then those gains have slowed a bit. Those gains in circulation have slowed a bit, but they're still we're still gaining. So that tells me that a people are, you know, um, waking up, if you will, to the fact that freedom isn't free, and they're paying for news. And uh, and I, I'm I'm convinced that uh, that good solid journalism uh, has a future. It's just really tough turning that corner, and, but we'll get it done. I think we will. Well, you said favorite story, and, and uh, I, my brain went completely different from all these people. Uh, I did think about uh, when we had a bridge across Lake Champlain uh, was closed on a Friday afternoon, like just closed, and no one could across the bridge. People work on the other side, one side or the other. Um, people wanted to know what to do, and we covered that story, and it was, you know, a public service it's online and, and, and got the news out there. Um, you know, I like having elections and, and exciting things like that. But the thing that jumped into my head was that uh, quite a few years ago now, we had a story of a local guy who um, just had was quirky, and he had this idea that he wanted to create these little dolls and these little dioramas with um, chipmunks. And um, there was tons of chipmunks around, and they died. <coughs> he could take their skins and taxiderm them, and then dress them up in little costumes and put them around wow. in dioramas. It, it was, I'm sure we were even put on the front page, but that story stuck with me because it was just a local character. It right? on that was, uh, uh, it might have been a Monday paper, but uh, you know, it was, the guy was just very odd, and we never had another story on him, but it was, that's a story that I remember, and I, I love. <laughs>
That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I hope it doesn't drive you away from subscription. Well, I have to follow that. <laughs> There's a guy in here. Um, my pessimism about the future of the paper version of newspapers does not extend to journalism. I, I think yeah. we're all going to, um, we're more and more craving real, um, legitimate news. And, and I think Art's right. I think, you know, um, I think Trump drove a lot of interest in news out there for better or for worse. Uh, and I think uh, the pandemic did too. You know, it is interesting to see the numbers going down somewhat with the online. So I, I, I don't, I don't know what that means. Um, but I, as I say, I, my pessimism isn't extended to uh, to to journalism itself. You know, I, I had a chance, as I told you, now three times to work with uh, Jasper, and you know, I look at a guy like him as as the future, who. Um, no, there's no bias in his reporting. It's just really hard gumshoe work. And about the film, oh my gosh, you know, I, I was saying to somebody before that I used to work with a guy, Sam Hemingway, at the Burlington Free Press, who, who looks a lot like, um, like uh, he does too. Um, a little bit of Mark Twain, I think, mixed in there too. But it just, um, you know, to see a guy who's, you know, going out back smoking a cigarette, I, I mean, that's just, I, I stopped smoking 20 years ago, but that was all part of the news experience for me too. So that was a, it was just a really fun, fun movie to watch. Thank you, and thanks for the nice, uh, the nice words, Mark. I think by my story I'm proud of stuff, not not any of the investigative pieces, but when I was at the Boston Globe covering Metro, there was a story of a family out in the Boondocks. They had a, a tortoise that they would let out in their their yard, and it was fully gated. There's no way to get out. But the tortoise escaped. One day they just came outside to bring the tortoise back and it was gone. No idea where it was. Two days later, 10 miles away, tortoise found. Across the highway, they just found a guy. Tortoise's name, Houdini. Perfect story. Perfect story. You can't make that shit up. Anyways, yeah. Weird animal stories are really just <laughs> the best. Um, and you should pay for them. Yeah. So thanks everybody for the uh, for coming today. We really appreciate it. Thank you to Art Collins. Really nice. Thank you. Thank you.